Yes, sir. How many countries can you see coming out of China? Uh, that's very interesting. Um, <coughs> who knows? I mean, obviously, it's that right now. That's a very important country. Uh, again, that's going to have to be an evolutionary process. Um, this, this government in, in uh, Beijing is is very much entrenched, and, and the people I talk to, um, uh, I'm in Florida now, we have a, a very potent uh, presence in, in China, and uh, our, our beer chief in, um, in uh, Shanghai is a very close friend, and, and we've talked a lot about that. And he said, you know, a lot will depend on how effectively the Beijing government is able to bring online the vast interior of China. Um, right now, the only really developed part of China is the, the fringe along the, um, along the litter route, if you will. Um, and that's where maybe a third of the, Japanese, the Chinese people are located, Shanghai, all the way down to Canton, down to Hong Kong. But if you look at the vast interior of the country, even bringing a third of those, uh, half of those people again online, would be the equivalent of bringing an entire United States into the world economy in one fell swoop. Um, that's going to result in enormous dislocations. Imagine suddenly having all of the automobiles, for instance, in the United States suddenly being operating um, in, over the course of, say, a decade or two um, in a new country. So I can see a lot of, of, a lot of tension. Because that's, that's extremely tribal. Oh, yes. Very, very, very big tribes. Oh, sure. All, all the tribes. Yep. Sure, there's Inner Mongolia, there's, um, the, oh, there's, there's a host of, uh, of different potential uh, countries, uh, nations there. Absolutely. And again, it's a question of, you know, will we be in for enormous bloodshed and turmoil there? Absolutely. Absolutely, because I think, you see, when you have a country like that, a centralized country like that, it's like having a pressure cooker. This pressure cooker has been cooking there for, for certainly for much of the 19th, for much of the 20th century. In the old days, remember, the, the China was basically organized on the basis of war wars and feudal areas all over the country. And it was only, you know, relatively recently, in the last couple of hundred years, they all came together in a centralized uh, regime. And I can certainly see that beginning to disassociate at some point. But it's going to mean some enormous dislocations and, and possibly an enormous chaos as well. Uh, let's try to maybe. Yes. Um, you talked about that you described the peace process very much as a, a small bunch of men with uh, their eye on, on wealthy trade routes. Mm -hmm. To what extent during that process did they actually consider the grievances and the roots of the war? and address those in that process? Well, not a lot. I mean, frankly, the war was over, and, and they, they really didn't, you know, they wanted to put all of that behind them, okay? What they were really looking at as a new organization for the world, as I said, they came to Paris and created themselves as the world government. And, and that, was, that was really, that was what was most important to them. The other thing that they needed to worry about also, remember, and this is something I didn't get into in my, in my talk, but um, what was the issue of the Bolsheviks. Um, and they, that played a very important background. Um, it was sort of the Basel uh, Continuo, if you will, under it all. Bolsheviks were the terrorists in those days. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not digressing too far from your point, but um, um, the Bolsheviks were, were very important because they were, they were the great fear overhanging this whole process. So rather than necessarily going back and then sort of refighting the war in some fashion, and remember this was supposed to be the war to end all wars, um, and this was supposed to be the peace of you know, an eternal peace, and it wasn't. And part of the reason it wasn't was also because the Bolsheviks were there, and they constantly had to keep one eye on that part of Europe. Uh, what was going to happen? The Bolsheviks had promised that uh, Lenin had promised that within you know 20 years uh, the Bolsheviks would be at the English Channel, um, and they all were petrified about that. <coughs> so that was an important undercurrent as well. Uh, I'm sorry, but am I digressing too far? Well, it, it was. I mean. Did they address the, 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 the roots of the conflict? Of the conflict? Yes. yes. Well, the roots of the conflict were really the question of who was going to uh, be the most powerful nation on, on the continent of Europe. So to that extent, they did. They addressed it directly because what they wanted was they wanted France and, and Britain to be the most important nations in Europe and Germany to be, um, Germany and Austria and Hungary basically destroyed. And that's exactly what they accomplished. They did accomplish that. They disassembled Austria and Hungary, uh, broke it up into its individual components. Um, and Germany, of course, was destined not to rise until Hitler came along uh, about 20 years later. You had questions. Um, how important was that for Israel? For Israel? Um, well, what would you about the future possibility for Israel? 
Right. Um, well, remember, they, the, uh, they came into the, the people that came to them. Uh, the question was how important was Versailles to the formation of the State of Israel? Uh, it, it was essential. Um, the, um, the, there were actually several treaties. I called them, I grouped them all under the, the umbrella rubric of the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty that actually dealt with the Ottoman Empire and, and Israel was the Treaty of San Remo, which was actually signed about a year later. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, um, they came into the, remember, they came into the peace conference with the Jews already pledged to have um, Palestine as their homeland uh, because Hein Weizmann had won that pledge from the British government. Um, so all they really did was ratify, effectively ratify the Balfour Declaration, which was necessary because it needed to be ratified in a multilateral uh, format, multinational format, and, and therefore guaranteed eventually by the League of Nations. Um, that was, of course, the um, attempt, vague attempt to create some sort of a world government that Wilson was desperate to have and the Europeans were not so desperate to have and that wound up being sort of a, an empty shell, if you will. But, but nevertheless, it did give the, the Jewish people the, the ability, the, right, the legal right to establish a homeland in, in Palestine. Excuse me, I don't believe yeah. that's true. Uh -huh. In 1947, mm -hmm. the United Nations allocated 55% Palestine to the Jews mm -hmm. and 45% to the Palestinians mm -hmm. by the United Nations. In 1967, mm -hmm. Israel decided they wanted the whole thing, therefore they invaded, and since then they've illegally occupied the Palestinian territories. Right. And that's the source of most of the problems in the Middle East. Right. But what, what I suggested also is, however, that, um, that you know, if you take areas like Gaza and, um, and, and, and the West Bank, um, these are areas that could easily have been carved out and, and given to the Palestinians. They were not. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, Jordan was obviously uh, created at that time as well. That was sort of intended to be um, the, the Palestinian homeland. Obviously, it didn't work very effectively. But the idea was that, um, was that the, 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 the Jews would have the entire territory of that part of the world. I don't believe that's true. Uh -huh. The 1947 UN resolution specifically said that's not true. Right. They invaded the occupied territories in 1967. They were told six months later under UN Security Council Resolution 242, which was passed by a majority of 15 to zero, to get out of the occupied territories. They did not. Two years later, the Security Council passed another resolution 338, which was also passed by a majority of 15 to 0, not only to get out of the occupied territories, but to disband the settlements. They did not do that either, and they've been there ever since. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Within six months, we had an army there of 500,000 people to kick them out. In 1967, Israel invaded Palestinian land, and we've done nothing about it. Well, all of this is that your, your chronology is absolutely correct, of course, and, and I commend you for knowing all of this in some in great detail. This never would have happened, however, if the Balfour Declaration hadn't awarded this, this territory that's originally to the Jews. That's 30 uh, years previously. That's right. Absolutely. The Balfour Declaration had no legal force. It was just Balfour's uh, uh, well, it, I, policy. I don't want to get Or even you might say the government policy. The San Remo Agreement, which ended the war with uh, the Ottoman Turks, did actually give them legal right to that territory, and that was in the that yeah, was ratified. and was also confirmed by the League of Nations. What was the date of that? 1920. Yeah, yeah. But it was all superseded in 1947 by the United 